Welcome everyone to the recording of the Metal Museum's first virtual event of 2021, a talk and demonstration of tributaries artist Ben Dory. I'm Rupert the Metal Museum's Collections and Exhibitions Manager, and also on the recording is Dorothy Swedek, the Museum's Exhibitions Coordinator, and artist Ben Dory, the reason you're watching. First, I want to tell you about the Metal Museum's Tributaries Exhibition Series. Derived from the museum's location along the Mississippi, this series features artists whose work is beginning to have a significant impact on the metal arts community and provides them with the opportunity for a solo exhibition. This exhibition, Tributaries, Ben Dory, Kissing Numbers, is on display at the museum through April 3rd, and we hope everyone will have the chance to come to the museum and see the show. Dorothy and I are grateful that Ben was able to come to the museum to speak about the work in his show and demonstrate his granulation technique. Before Dorothy introduces Ben, I would like to acknowledge our supporters. The Metal Museum receives exhibition and programming support through the Wingate Foundation and Hyde Family Foundation, and operational support through Arts Memphis and Tennessee Arts Commission. We thank our sponsors for their continued support. And now, please enjoy the recording of Ben Dory's artist talk and demonstration. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce Ben before we dive right into the questions. But um, yeah, this um, you're here to hear from Ben. <laughs> ben is an artist and metalsmith originally from Kansas City, Kansas. He received his BFA in metalsmithing and jewelry from the University of Kansas and his MFA in metalsmithing from the Southern Illinois University Carbondale in 2014. While maintaining his studio practice, Ben explored various disciplines within the arts, including technician work, product design, nonprofit programming, research, and workshop instruction. Ben is currently the artist in residence at, in metals at the University of Arkansas Little Rock's Wingate Center of Art and Design. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ben. We appreciate it. We're so excited to learn more about you and your work and then see your process in action during your demonstration. And then um, for those who joined us today, feel free to drop any questions you guys have for Ben in the chat. Just make sure to send it to everyone and um, I'll keep an eye on those and we'll, um, we'll address them as they come in and maybe save a few for the very end of um, our talk today. But um, I think that's all of the introduction and housekeeping I had. So um, let's jump right in with our first question. So um, Ben, can you tell us about your background as an artist? How did you start working with metal as a medium and why jewelry? Great, um, first of all, hello everybody. Um, very thrilled to be here. Just a deep thank you to the Metal Museum. Um, it's been the most wonderful experience setting up the show and getting to this point. Um, and also a very kind of deep and profound thank you to the Wingate Foundation who has kind of been with me every step of the way and support me in my position now and are supporting this show in general. Um, so kind of going way back and getting started just with creative work in general. Uh, I grew up in a, a house surrounded by people who were always working with their hands with a wood shop or sewing or just making kind of like craft objects in general to kind of working on repairs in the house um, it was always this kind of just material, tactile knowledge was present, ever present in my entire life. Um, and that kind of extended to just drawing and my brothers have always kind of drawn and kept a sketchbook. Um, and as the youngest of the whole group, I got to absorb all these, um, just ideas and materials and, um, their inspiration kind of imparted on me in many ways. Um, so just going into public schooling, I was very fortunate to live in a place where the arts were well-funded and there was a metal smithing program at my high school. So that was my first exposure to this wonderful material. And I think when you talk about kind of how do you find your way in craft, how do you pick your material to work with, there's a discussion of kind of resistance or pushback. So if you're working with clay, of course you can mold it. And the kind of pushback of metal has always really kind of spoken to me. Uh, and I just like the, the pace of it, it's methodic. Um, you do have to fight it often, um, but it's very, it's gratifying when things go your way, but it takes quite a bit to get the, to that point. 
Um, I studied other things, languages. Eventually, um, I was in uh, a path to go towards sciences and taxonomy. Uh, but I always had some sort of creative presence in my life. So I painted for a while, the sketchbooks were there. Um, I was always just making things. And for metals, I got to this point where I was in college and you run into those like, huge university intro to science classes. So this was a chemistry class and it didn't feel right. So, and then just as intuitively, I was like, oh, I think I'll go into metals. It was a really kind of, uh, kind of strange decision, I think, but I kind of changed everything and took an intro to metals class. And that's kind of the, that's the story. Uh, and then my instructors there, uh, John Havener being one of them, he introduced me to John Paul Miller's work, uh, his beautiful granulated objects and jewelry. And since then, I've just really loved that, loved that process. I know. So as a start, uh, get us going. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, that kind of flows like directly into our next question, um, which uh, I know you'll be doing a demo later today, but if you could briefly explain the sort of stainless steel granulation technique that you use for everyone on the call and, and why you chose to work with this technique. Sure, that will, um, yeah, so we'll talk about these uh, machines a little bit. Um, so to kind of like dive into the material itself, stainless steel in general, I found out when I was at Carbondale, um, working in a smithy, uh, not doing a ton of blacksmithing, but cutting material, grinding, welding, and fabricating these sculptural objects. Um, and they always had this kind of jeweler's sense to them, I was setting stones in the steel and like putting the whole thing in the forge to develop fire scale and texture. I found out while working in that environment that along the way I developed some pretty serious metals allergies, which, uh, you know, at that point in life after making a decision to go to school was uh, uh, a little like heartbreaking and you have to pivot quite a bit to kind of stay on board. Like I wanted to continue to do this work. Uh, so I started making these kind of book objects and then these are fabricated welded aluminum. Um, and this was my thesis work in Carbondale, but I needed to find a way to work with a less reactive material just in general. And I found that aluminum besides being like really just like wonderful to work with, um, I wasn't reacting to it. Um, so looking at the kind of shared family of aluminum, you have titanium and niobium and all those reactive metals I found I can work with um, really well in this cleaner environment that wasn't kind of irritating by my hands and arms, like there's all sorts of complications. Um, so as stainless kind of came into the conversation, it was just another material I wanted to work with that wouldn't kind of drive me nuts. Like I could like continually work on it for hours. Um, so approaching the granulation, um, I bought this welder. We'll definitely be looking at this a little more later. So this is an ABI Tech 2 welder. And you would use something like this for putting the you know, fusion findings on earrings. So there's a little tab on the bottom and as the current goes through it, it'll kind of create a big spark and weld it. So a little sparky is a machine that um, people will use to attach findings in that way. Um, but at the time I was doing a lot of damascene work. Um, so chiseling the steel, creating a texture so you could do a push and overlay of thin metal foils. And the, the findings on the, the back of these brooches was this tiny, tiny tubing. So like hypodermic tubing, that was maybe a half millimeter across, and that is what would hold the brooch back. Um, so holding something like that in place and soldering stainless and keeping it exactly where you want it to be is kind of a, a pain. Um, I think a lot of metal smiths like thinking about that, setting up the infrastructure to solder. Um, I wanted a better way to fix everything in place. So. This, I think I was waiting for a friend that lived in Louisville and I happened to get on my phone and a friend had told me about Armstrong Tools in Detroit. So I just looked at their website because it's fun to look at metal smithing tools and they happen to have this for half price. 
And I was like, okay. And I was kind of broke at the time. Um, and this was way out of my budget, but I knew in the studio, it would be, uh, it would increase my efficiency to this enormous degree. Um, so I got it. And as I learned how to use it, I was attaching the findings and then soldering them. I started researching the machine more and found out more and more that the company had this granulation type setup that's pretty exact to what I do now. So I didn't invent this. I think we need to be really clear about it, but they had a setup that includes a, a vacuum and you pick up the granules and put it in place and and then you would weld the two pieces together. Um, and that, I, I tried it and it doesn't work really well. In the like single article where there's an example of doing this process, they were attaching platinum, no, gold granules to platinum, like 14 karat gold to platinum. So pretty conductive. Um, and in working with the conductive materials, I found out this wasn't working at all. So I started playing around with like, well, what could work and initially using little bits of mild steel, I found that it welds beautifully. Um, so kind of thinking about what I could do with that, this kind of like history of paying attention to granulated forms and just like finding it captivated, um, this work began to develop. So stainless really emerged through a desire to keep working in metal and I wouldn't have an allergic reaction to it. And then this kind of serendipity of life um, kind of brought this machine into the equation and um, I just began playing around with it. I think that's, wow. yeah, so that's kind of like the origin story of, of how <laughs> this works. And there were a lot of like uh, leaps, like logical kind of like deductive leaps. So I was like, well, if this works like this, that might work, but those decisions usually involved a lot of risk financially to get a machine to buy materials to just to experiment because I never knew if any of it would actually work out, uh, but I'm happy it did. Yeah, Ben, just hearing you speak, the thing like the word that keeps coming to mind is adaptation, right? Like you're right. Uh, you're adapting the material you're working with, and uh, one person actually was curious what in particular you were allergic to <laughs> blacksmithing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> So copper has always been something that's bothered me, but it's not terrible. But I found out like cobalt, I have this really horrible allergy to cobalt and it's in a lot of tool steels and I was making chisels doing that kind of stuff, but also uh, it's an additive in grinding belts that would help everything kind of like adhere or I don't know the kind of exactly what's going on, but imagine kind of like working in a shop and you're welding and then you're grinding down seams, cleaning things up and all that would spray on my arms. And, and pretty much it'd be like a horrible kind of like itchy mess for a while. Uh, and then one summer when I started making the books, it was particularly bad and I couldn't really work at all. So I, I, I needed to switch or stop doing this altogether. Again, adaptation, <laughs> switch it up. Um, and as you're speaking, we had another question come in that I'll just ask quickly. Um, someone was curious if you make or buy the granules that you work with. Um, all these stainless ones, I buy these. So I source them from wherever I can in the world, but these are actually like micro uh, bearing balls. So these are what would go into ball bearings and in, Importantly, like, so learning all these kind of like weird things about um, kind of like peripheral parts of the industrial metal world. Um, you can buy these in different grades of spherosity. Um, so like grade zero would be a theoretical, like perfect sphere. And then there's grade 1000 and then there's kind of tumbling media where they're all different. But these are all grade 100, which means they're really spherical. And that's important for the whole process for everything to fit together. The less exact they are, the more the patterns will um, kind of like unwind themselves as they grow. Um, but yeah, so I buy these where I can. Um, and it, it, it's pretty interesting to see how like, wildly the price will swing depending on like how it's made, where it's made, where you buy it. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move forward with a question that um, 
I myself had when I was first introduced to the title of your exhibition, Kissing Numbers. Um, so we're just curious, how does granulation relate to this term of kissing numbers um, that you've used in your exhibition? Um, so kissing numbers is a term in geometry and it describes the maximum number of equally sized spheres that can fit around a central one. Um, so in two dimensions, so just in circles, if you have a, a, a central circle, you can put six circles around that and it'll fit exactly. Um, so you create these little kind of like flower motifs. Um, so once you get into three dimensions, you can have, oh, this is a great image. Um, you can have 12 spheres fitting around that central one. So this is really key because um, there's two basic formations here. Like if you're kind of to pick this form apart um, and it's the two modular units that uh, this whole thing is based on. So imagine uh, like sphere stacking, cannibal stacking, or like you have a, a stack of oranges at the grocery store. It'll create those types of forms. Um, but in this shape, the two main forms would be um, three spheres on the bottom. And then there's, a central sphere on the second level nesting in there. And then the other example would be four spheres on the bottom, making a square with one in the middle there. Um, so one creates kind of cubic lattices and cubic structures, and the other one will create hexagonal lattices. And then those will kind of intertwine as the forms grow. Um, but this is a really kind of important base unit for all of the work um, because it helps me kind of like decide what patterns are potential, but there's also this really kind of finite, uh, finite parameters for how the patterns can evolve. So the more I learn how, say, this triangular structure might fit on the end of a cubic structure, um, that's kind of, it adds to my kind of shape vocabulary. And the more that grows, the more the patterns can change and adapt, or I can more kind of intelligently like move away from that structure, especially when it's on a, a curved surface um, where that geometry changes. Um, so it's the kissing numbers in general is a, a very kind of like convenient way to describe the structures in general. Um, but knowing that this kind of like mathematical world has already really figured this out, I can dip into that and it helps me, helps inform the work. Um, Every day. Awesome. We have a couple of questions in the chat um, about um, the alloy that you use. So um, Janine asked, is the steel that you buy in granule form always the same alloy? And does that matter or not so much? And then someone else, Joe, asked what alloy works for granules. Okay, so these are great questions. So it's less about the alloy. Um, so that's really married to um, gold granulation, like where you have to change things, whether it's a 18 karat going to 20, or if you get it rose gold or green gold, the fluxes will change. Um, so for this whole kind of like approach to granulation, the conductivity of the material is crucial. So no matter what the stainless alloy is, the conductivity is extremely low. Um, and that's what enables all of this to happen. And we'll kind of dive into that later on, but it's based off of resistance welding. So like the lower the conductivity, the higher the resistance, and you need that for this weld to occur. Um, so these granules, um, I'll buy usually two types. I'll buy 200 series, 201, and I'll buy 304 or 316 uh, because that hardness is really important. Because um, especially as you're creating kind of a, a sculptural form or even trying to fit a ring of granules around a central form, they, they're not always going to fit. So if you looked at the pieces really up close, you'll see like small gaps here. Everything's not always touching. Sometimes there's a, a compromise of space because I don't predetermine that like 90 granules will fit around this form. I just start working on it and then adapt if it doesn't quite fit. So the 200 series is soft enough that I can facet aside with just like a, a steel block and a hammer and kind of squish the granule a little bit so it'll pop into place. And then the 316, um, that doesn't work really well. That's when you're putting a, a dent into your bench block. 
Um, so mostly working with those two, but thinking about conductivity, that also means that I can use certain nickel alloys, um, like steel copper alloys, like Ingvar, um, Monell comes into the equation for nickel, um, and that kind of caps out for this process. Um, but yeah, those are really important questions. And the more I've been playing with this, it's becoming clear what read the right, what the right question is. So less about the specific alloy, but more about is it available and affordable and how conductive is it? Kind of as a follow-up to that, um, we got a question from someone just asking if you could um, maybe take a kind of a step back and describe the work that you do in more general terms and kind of just more layman, layman's terms, explaining oh, what sure. is granulation? <laughs> How does it work? Right, so historically granulation is um, fusing, fusing like generally like small spheres, like we'll say gold spheres onto a gold surface. Um, so it's a way of using heat and these kind of chemical additives where um, the joint between the sheet metal and the granule itself, it'll create a different alloy at the point of connection and it will permanently bond that together. And this is ancient. Um, you know, there's work going back to, I don't know, maybe like the oldest one I found. If you go to the Met website, they have one from maybe like 2500 BCE. Um, and I think this was tied into like magic and metallurgy, you know, and it was very kind of like important in ceremony and, um, right, and it still has all these magical qualities. So applying granules in this way is just like a newer method to do it. And Opi Untracht, I think, in his book from the 60s talked about, um, it's less about the process of how it's attached, but more about those spheres being attached to the surface. Although it's not limited to that. It's just, the big deal is this chemical bonding where um, solder will can get messy and fill in areas and this has a really delicate like minute point where the spheres will attach um, so what i do is create base forms and then adorn it with thousands of tiny spheres and it creates these intricate patterns and you get lost in them and um, i find it compelling to work in this way especially like looking back and and like observing the pieces when they're done um, I hope that answers the question. Yes. Um, and then if you have any, um, or maybe we have some images we could share too for some folks to kind of get a better idea of what granulation looks like. Oh, sure. Maybe. I'm working on, I'm working on it. Great. Okay. Thank you, bro. <laughs> yeah. And thank you okay. for the questions and comments, guys. <laughs> Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, this is wonderful. I like this kind of conversational kind of approach to it. Um, so, and I think there's a, on their website, there's a walkthrough of the gallery. And then as you walk through the gallery, you can click on the images and see blown up versions of it. And then it looks like we're about to see something here. Here we go. So this piece is the kind of like my kind of expression of kind of like love for the history of granulation and my homage to John Paul Miller and in combining the gold and silver granulation with the stainless, I really wanted to kind of marry these two worlds. So this one is based off of one of John Paul Miller's work. Um, and he lived and worked in Cleveland um, for a long, long time at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And he was really a pioneer of this um, approach and like rediscovering it. It never went away, but granulation kind of like comes into um, the kind of like craft or jewelry picture and then fades away for a while, is forgotten somewhat, and then gets reintroduced. So he gave that to my teacher's generation in a big way, amongst other people. Um, but this is based off of a piece in the, in the Smithsonian. Um, and he really loved to do these insect forms and aquatic kind of jellyfish squid kind of form. Um, so on the bottom there, that's forged Monel. Um, and then all the stainless granules, you can see it coming together. And then that metal strip that's been over, that's fine silver or pure silver granulation, and then 24 karat gold granulation mixed across that band in the middle. And this one really kind of like epitomizes um, kind of like what can be like my experimentation to that 
time. Like, so I had found out I can use nickel alloys in the Monel. Um, I started uh, exploiting like more negative space in the pieces instead of filling it up because it can definitely get too busy. Um, so learning to back off a little bit. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of the, the centerpiece of the, the show. That kind of flows right into our next question we have, um, which is kind of, is there an idea or inspiration you have for the jewelry included in the, in the show? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, so in the show, there is uh, a number of series of works. Um, so with each piece, no matter kind of like where the inspiration comes from, I'm always trying something new, trying to experiment with the new material. Um, so with John Paul Miller's work, like he was the inspiration for this piece. And I would like to pursue that more. Um, on other ones, it's technical. So I'm trying to push the boundaries of what I've learned so far. Um, so you can't have these solid structures where like you're building these stacks of granules, but what if you start to like move off on the side, like creating an arc of rainbows. And I might find out that's not structural enough to be a piece of jewelry. Um, and then a lot of them are inspired with material exploration. So combining pearls or sequins with it, um, softer materials that don't really fit into kind of like how almost like sterile, surgical, kind of inert stainless can be in general. So I'm trying to like lighten it up with other materials. Um, like faux fur has started to kind of like come into a few pieces, things like that. Um, and then other kind of like long standing themes are starting to be reintroduced. And in the show, we'll have some images later of some 3D printed pieces. Um, and I really love this idea of adaptation in terms of growth. Uh, and this thing that always comes to mind, like if I'm driving across Tennessee, if I'm going from Memphis to Knoxville, as you kind of climb an elevation, you'll start seeing kudzu like covering buildings and this idea of this uh, kind of organic mass that's like climbing over and covering everything. So moss growth, lichen growth. Um, and then with that also um, another body of kind of interest that is similar, but kind of changes a little bit is kind of like how cells change. So like stem cell growth and how things specialize. And there is this, and it's kind of gross, but endlessly fascinating to me, this something called a teratoma, which is a kind of cancerous stem cells. But as those cells start to specialize, um, they will, they'll open up this piece of tissue and there'll be like hair and teeth and bones, hepatic cells, heart cells. Um, so these things that shouldn't be together in one place, but how these cells are like trying to survive and find room and to specialize. So that idea of things kind of like growing over other forms, but also the idea of things kind of like emerging and kind of displacing other materials. And there's this kind of like endless metaphors that can happen with it. So while you're at the bench, you, you have time to think. And these are kind of things that go through my mind. So for inspiration, um, biology, cell growth. Um, I love this website called uh, Nikon Small Worlds, and it's a competition they've been having for a few decades now, but it's micro photography, um, and it just has like the coolest stuff, and there's videos on it right now. Um, but this looking at those invisible worlds, things that we can't see with the naked eye, but are very much a part of everything that surrounds us. So all that part of my inspiration. Awesome. As you were speaking, a couple more questions came in that were kind of process oriented. So I might um, interject a few of those um, quickly. When you're um, working, do you create in sets and then combine your sets or do you do one granule at a time? One granule at a time. And we'll go over this in the demo, but this is a, like a tiny silver vacuum. So using this to pick up a granule at a time and they all get individually welded in place. So the bigger pieces easily have thousands and thousands of granules on them. Um, and the patterns start to describe themselves after a little bit, getting everything going. Um, that's what takes the most time really. And then, and it is worth noting that all the pieces are 
hollow constructed. So you had this kind of blank canvas of a stainless shell. And then over that shell, all the green rules are applied to that. Gotcha. Another question I'll just um, quickly ask, do you ever use non-spherical granules? Would that work with your technical process? Uh, yeah, so I've played around with like little pins and rods. Um, it, you need to create a specific type of geometry. So imagine a sphere sitting on a flat surface. So where the curve of the sphere is in contact with that flat surface is a teeny tiny point of contact. Um, and this goes more into like how this works in general, but if you picture an hourglass and energy is kind of going from one side and then bottlenecks down, and the idea is that to like open up and go through. Um, as that bottleneck happens, if there's, it's also creating heat because you have all this kind of jamming into a smaller space. So if there's too much energy, it'll short. So you're like breaking a circuit system at that point. And in that blast of energy, it's so hot that it'll weld right there. So if you can recreate that kind of hourglass shape out of whatever shape, um, whether it's like a tube shape or a sphere or whatever it might be, then this works. So I've done some experimental pieces using, uh, yeah, just like little pins, like little tiny short pieces of, of wire, uh, but it does need, or it definitely helps for it to be as smooth of a surface as you can make it because you wanna make sure it shorts out or welds where you want it to instead of, you know, on another part of the piece. So when things go wrong in this whole process, it is destructive and it will destroy all the work around it. So you do like, so if you have this blast of energy in the wrong spot, then there's problems. Yeah, and thinking about like that, the process itself, how long does it take you to complete a piece on average, would you think? Let's see. So maybe if we use one of the brooches as an example, uh, so working with stainless in general is a little bit of a, a bear. It ruins your tools. It's hard to cut. It's hard to bend. Um, and it's all worked cold. Um, so this piece has a flat sheet on the bottom, but a lot of them with the small domes. So if we go to that next slide with the yellow ring, mm -hmm. that would be a good example. Um, so this is a, a giant room. It's about two inches tall, uh, but in each of those sections, so the stone setting at the top, the, that's the piece of tube that's been opened up with a hydraulic press and then the dome that it's sitting in, you have to punch a hole and then make the dome. So using dapping tools. So figuring out the infrastructure of the piece is how I think about it and making sure everything is in, is in its right place before it's TIG welded, that takes quite a while. And down to like cutting the material and then sanding, filing stainless tends to take a little longer. Um, and then kind of counter to how jewelry might usually be made is all the stones are set first and then the patterns start to emerge around it. And then in the open space at the top there, there's some white sequins, then those will be added and then there's a layer on top of that. So things are kind of shifting around all the time. Um, so this piece, like only working on this one took, um, I was teaching at the same time, but two or three weeks, like working on it steadily. And then kind of what I was mentioning earlier on the rings that are going around the entire thing, um, it's not always so tidy. So you won't have a perfect ring of granules around, um, say that top tubing. So I'll have to adjust, maybe if I get all the way around and I find out that like a two millimeter granule won't work, then I have to go in and like remove everything using pliers um, and it's, you know, ruining the surface of the material too. So then you refinish the surface, use a different size. Um, and the longer I spin on all this, like the better informed I am as far as like what size will work where, how to test this out. Um, but they take a while overall. So yeah, there's definitely not like a, a quick version of all of these. A labor of love. <laughs> For sure. And then um, our next question is, uh, how has COVID-19 kind of impact, 
impacted your practice, you know, in 2020 and, and now going into 2021? Uh, like, incredibly so, you know, so it's like shaken up everybody's lives. Um, in some ways, I was just having a conversation earlier today, like since we've had to rely more on maybe like at-home technologies or a Zoom meeting, something like that, we've been able to catch up technologically, especially when it comes to kind of like working with computers and screens. But last March, when everything got going, my school switched to online classes and I didn't touch metal or go to the studio for four months, right? So it's abstract idea of like jewelry and making and, you know, what it means to be in the studio. Uh, so in that time, something that I really wanted to focus on for a long time was uh, kind of improving my 3D modeling skills, but especially working on parametric modeling. Um, so to describe that, instead of uh, like the opposite of that would be direct modeling, where you take some shapes and curves and you create a form, and at the end you're left with one object. So in parametric modeling, you build scenarios. So you build a scenario. Um, I wonder, do we have an image of, can we go back to the brooch with the white and blue and black with the stone set in it? Mm -hmm. um, so this piece is one of the first um, kind of outcomes of this new type of work. But in parametric modeling, um, I've been using software called uh, Houdini's effects, and it's used most in movies um, and games, that type of thing. But if you want special effects, if you want like uh, anything like eroding or crumbling or liquids moving, like things that take on these organic qualities, you would use this type of software. Um, but I found out you can model with it. So going back to the idea where you can um, work with like the scenario of something. In these particular pieces, I created the scenario for stone setting on any type of surface. So included in that is a tool where I could um, kind of slide a bar and I'll increase the size of a stone, um, but also a setting tool where I can increase the size of the setting tool. Does it cut up? Does it cut down? But then I can tell the software to scatter those stones of different sizes across the surface. So once the scenario is cut up, I can take any kind of topology and scatter different sized stones across it and tell it how many stones to set. So in this one, I think there's a, a range of maybe like three to six millimeter stones, three to five millimeter stones. And then you'll see little pinpricks in there too. Those are little settings for granules themselves that kind of like look like a thermometer cut it up. Um, so COVID has allowed me to make work like this. I had the time, like I was already sitting on a computer all day teaching. And then I sat at the computer further for hours, like learning this and starting to design some new work. Um, and then this brooch back, like things started to come together this is a brooch back scene on most of them. So taking that and then adding in the larger um, model pieces. And then the material on this is just a flexible 3D printed material. And what that allows, instead of setting a, a stone with like bending over that little bit of material, I can like pull it open and put the stone in and it'll spring back into place securing the stone. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's been, you know, it's changed my whole perspective on studio and where I can work and how I can work. This involves more, um, like when I don't have printers available, I'll need to outsource this so a new type of working as far as like in industry relationships. Um, and on the other side is just planning, being adaptable, just being uh, more flexible with life in general. Um, you know, and I think everybody can empathize with that. So it's been uh, a boom in a lot of ways, but it's also been kind of, I don't know, isolating and terrible in so many ways as well. Right, and um, your answer to that question seems like a great lead-in um, to my next in that we're curious about what other processes you might be interested in exploring in the future. 
any new digital or modern techniques you'd like to learn, you know, um, thinking about you're working with new technologies and softwares and stuff. Um, so yes, so more Houdini, more of that. Um, I wanna <laughs> become just like more proficient at it because I'm finding out like whatever you can imagine, like so you can model a whole, let's say like teapot or something like that. And then you can have it like erode and then you could 3D print it but you don't have to use plastics. Like, so 3D printing and metal is something I've begun experimenting with and pursuing that to a larger degree. Um, it's becoming more available, more affordable. Um, even in the past six months, a new service has arrived where um, instead of you know minimum order would be like 200, $1,000, something like that, the minimum order is $20. Um, so it's becoming a more accessible technology um, and going back to it might it would have happened eventually anyway but i think in this type of scenario the pandemic has accelerated that access in a lot of ways um, because it's pushed an industry that people are looking to use from home um, and i think between yeah so like printing industry like just having like access to those industrial processes that are becoming more of a kind of like desktop, you could say. Uh, that's not a machine I would want to have in my studio. They do take a lot to kind of like take care of. Um, and just, and like other skills, like I want to learn how to like sew better, you know, and like start to integrate more uh, like textiles into the work, like really on this search of combining materials because this, the granulation, then it is what it is. It's going to have a certain look to it. So I'm always looking for new textures, new colors, um, kind of things to soften up that look. So I think that's kind of like where we're headed. Um, and then just figuring out ways to, like a lot of the work in the show is like large and it really demands attention. And I love that. Um, like jewelry has this relationship with the wearer and the viewer and it's this really incredible thing. Um, but these are like, enormous pieces by kind of like some jewelry standards. So I want to make more like solitary or something more kind of like manageable to uh, maybe like a daily wear. But. I think that flows um, directly into our, our last question we have, which is, are you working on anything new right now? Right, so like designs for that, um, for that kind of like daily wearable, I mean, they'll still be big. Um, and I'm finding like pushing those boundaries is fun, but kind of tapering it back and making more um, kind of like, I think we're gonna have a picture of my wife's Emily's ring. So it's a, it's a pretty good uh, and fun scenario. But Emily gets a, a ring every year. And this was from a couple years ago and they don't all look like this. Like, like she'll get probably like a piece of yarn one year when I don't have time, but. Um, this was an exceptional standout and I want to make more work like this. And these settings are challenging in a, di a different way because it's about uh, creating a bezel setting and fabricating it from stainless where usually you would do this in gold, silver, platinum. Um, and just because it's harder to work with in a lot of ways. Um, so pushing this, sourcing materials, like as far as the stones, like finding big stones that are affordable is a little bit of a trick. Um, and really developing kind of like, especially in this box form, the, the base form will depict what patterns are possible to a certain degree. So I'm always going to be like learning new ways that these granules are going to be able to, um, set a stone. Um, and especially on the other pieces, you might've seen that they're setting sequins, like the heat is so localized on these where, so you can set a pearl you can hold a sequin down. And in this case, the, the granules themselves are setting the stone. So there's a seat underneath it that's cut, but then those are acting as little tiny prongs around the entire thing. Um, and then more 3D printing. Um, another piece in the show, um, yeah. So this is the, the newest piece. This, was finished maybe like a week before um, all the work was delivered. Um, so on the other like larger necklaces and uh, the brooch you saw a little while ago, that's a, an opaque flexible material. 
Um, but I started playing with this one, which is transparent and flexible in a very different way. Uh, this has longer elongation. And what's really cool is that after it's printed, it had, it's like being transparent. Uh, you can see all the print lines, you can see everything inside, which is creating the color, but you can soak it in alcohol ink and it'll absorb that, material, that, that color, that tinting. And that's the base for this, but then they're painted on the inside and then there's more alcohol ink on it. So playing with color is something that has always been um, intimidating, really. Uh, I remember when I was like, you know, dabbling with painting, it was the hardest thing to like find a palette stick to that color scheme, stuff like that, just because the endless options are um, yeah, intimidating. So kind of diving back into that world and trying to work with motifs. Um, so this is really exciting. And then this is a good example of what um, Houdini can do. So all those clusters on the side, those this, the, of the 3D printed part, those spheres that are packed together, those can get bigger, smaller, you can make them spread out, change the density of them. And then for the stones themselves, like there could be more or less of those. Uh, so really combining materials, playing with the 3D printing um, on the back of this one, that's uh, just aluminum that's gone through a rolling mill, patinated and painted. Uh, so I love the idea of like combining all of these materials. And after working with kind of exclusively stainless for so long, uh, these like softer materials, these other materials are like so Kind of like welcome just to like manipulate and move around because it's more just like conducive to uh, moving and forming. Uh, but I think that's yeah, the, the near future, more rings and then more stuff like this. Well, we can't wait to see it all. <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> Awesome. Well, um, then we had a few questions that came in through the chat that we didn't get a chance to talk about. So I'll just address those quickly with you if that's all right. Yeah. Um, the first one I'll ask you is how does patterning change with the introduction of different size granules? Is there a ratio or formula that you have in mind to keep while, um, or keep in mind while choosing sizes? Uh, this is a, a great question. So I really try to buy the granules in kind of like half millimeter steps because um, it on one side it's easier to organize in a lot of ways but um, so if, but if I have like a three millimeter granule as like a central form then I could put a ring of one millimeter granules around the edge of it but not one and a half millimeter granules so if I want things to fit together and stay systematic then deciding what size everything is makes a, a huge difference, um, especially if you want to close forms. But if I'm doing kind of like an open scallop or something like that, um, you can kind of sketch with it and play with it. And then none of the pieces are really planned out beyond that basic form. So when the granules start uh, kind of defining themselves or the patterns start defining themselves, then a lot of times it's circumstantial. Be like, well, I have this much room and I want either like an ornate pattern, which would be the one millimeter granules or something that's kind of like blocking out space that might act as infrastructure to hold up smaller granules. Um, so you are working across the surface, but um, absolutely there's also this depth to them and there's structure of granules underneath other ones, kind of like buttresses uh, holding up something else. Um, so how much do I consider it? Um, it's in the moment, but how much does it impact the pattern um, enormously? Because I could make the same ring and then at one point decide to use like two millimeter granules instead of a one millimeter granule and that will change the whole look and feel of, of the piece overall. Um, so I love that kind of like limitless potential, but in the framework of only having a few options to work with, which would be the sizes. Awesome. And uh, another question, you were kind of talking about surfaces other than the granules and for parts that are larger than the granules, do you use resistance welding alone to attach them? Or are you kind of positioning them for like other soldering operations? Um, so I don't 
solder much at all anymore. Um, well, in this world, well, besides teaching, but so everything is welded. So TIG welding. Um, so things can, well, okay. So like resistance welding, like this machine is called a TAC2. I think part of the kind of like philosophy behind it is that you would like tack it in place and then solder it or weld it. So um, yeah, absolutely. Like findings, especially the brooch backs, like I'll drill through holes, but then resistance weld it in place and then TIG weld it permanently onto the surface. Um, so it is helpful in process beyond granulating itself. Awesome. Um, and do you dap your own spheres slash base forms? Yes. And that's all with the hydraulic press. Uh, yeah, so there's not a lot of like swinging a hammer, anything like that. It might get, it might like dent it a little bit, but I really need like that 5,000, 10,000 PSI to make forms. And a lot of the pillow forms, especially um, since I'm, I can't really anneal the stainless, um, it's pushing the press quite a bit. So I get custom cut, especially for like Bourget pieces or um, like more complicated forms. There's lots of pushers that are like custom made, custom cut to go inside of the, the form that's begun to pillow to like keep pushing it, keep pushing it. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a trick to find that sweet spot before, like how far can you push it before the metal tears? Uh, but yeah, that's all done in the studio and talking about time, like we were before, that's one of the most time consuming parts. Then I think we just have one more question to address in the chat and then we can take our, our break and begin the demo. Um, but in response to, I believe it was the Bon Bon ring, um, someone wrote, that ring is lovely. Does it weigh a ton? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, it's it's probably the heaviest object in the show. But wait a time, do you think it was? Uh, yeah, so it's about, you know, get the camera right. You know, real big. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's probably like three ounces, something like that. It's pretty heavy. And um, they had a follow-up question thinking, and you spoke a little bit on it, but if there's any more you want to share about um, how your work with like sequins and gemstones um, do or don't respond to current as you're working. Oh, so as long as the material is not current, you're talking about electricity? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, if something is not conductive, it's totally unaffected, which is kind of wonderful. It's just one thing you don't have to worry about. Um, so whether it fits in, so that's knowing that you can attach maybe like alternative materials, we'll call it that, to the surface with the granules, like what do you choose to do with that? Um, and I'm still pretty kind of like finite or like focused in how I think about those materials, but um, it's really kind of like fun to like imagine that. So, but again, the kind of like dangers of it, if you aren't holding onto the granule well enough or, and we'll get into this in, in the demo, if the, like the vacuum tip is off a little bit and it's short and you have this kind of explosion of energy that will absolutely like ruin a stone, melt sequins, damage other granules. Um, so there is a little kind of, um, it can be te treacherous sometimes, especially if you have like an overhang, you have to like reach into a little kind of area to attach um, a sequin or something like that. So it's not without its kind of kind of dangers and pitfalls. Um, but yeah, so like whatever you can imagine that's not conductive can be set with the stainless process. Well, I don't think we have any more questions in the chat. So thank you so much, Ben. And we are, we are going to take, um, for everyone on the call, we are taking a five minute break between the talk we just finished and the demonstration. We have a short video that I'm going to play for you that's uh, showing um, the exhibition for everyone who hasn't seen it yet. Um, the video is about one minute in length, so I'm just going to loop it. So feel free to get up, stretch your legs uh, before we start the demo.
All right. Hi, everybody. Are we, everybody see me all right? Are we good? Okay. So you can go over the kind of welding unit and then the whole setup, but there's really not that many components, but it does involve wiring, kind of strategizing how the electricity is going to flow. So it's kind of like an imaginative exercise a little bit. Uh, so the welder in general, I'm going to pull this over. So ABI is a company that I think they're based in Rhode Island for a long time, and they have made uh, a number of different types of welders. Um, so the kind of class of welder that this would be is a capacitive discharge welder or a CD welder. Um, so and what that means is that it, as you turn up the voltage or whatever units that they're using on that welder, then there's going to be like two enormous capacitors inside of this machine that hold all of that energy. And then when you hit a trigger, it'll release it all at once. Um, so we do have an image. I think now is probably just a good time to look at it. So I opened up the machine um, recently. I just had to kind of work on some connections of it. But when we see this picture of it, you'll see these like two very large blue components. There we go. Perfect. Um, okay, so on the bottom right of this picture, so that's the knob that controls the voltage. So, but as you turn that up, um, in those blue capacitors, that's where all the energy is stored. And as you kind of line everything up, it's going to empty out all of that energy at once. And this is really useful because you need that like, burst of energy, kind of what I was talking about earlier with the hourglass kind of metaphor you, for every single granule that's attached, you want to break the circuit or short the circuit at that point of contact. And then if there's not enough energy, then you're gonna have a weak weld. If there's too much energy, you either over melt it or kind of like explode the scenario. That situation going on is going to like damage other granules, sequence, like whatever materials are on there. Um, and that is where like heat gets out of control. But in an ideal situation, you have this perfect balance of shorting the circuit with heat, but it doesn't spread out. And um, on this machine, I'm usually working between 20 and 40 volts. Um, okay, so if we can go back to the camera, please. Um, okay, so the other components here, so I have a positive lead and a negative lead. Um, and the positive lead, we'll talk about this more in a minute here, but this is going to be what picks up the granules themselves. And then the negative side is going to this large kind of metal plate. So, and often I don't work on this directly. Um, I'll put a steel block on it, I'll put a vise on it, um, something else where the energy can flow through it, or you can use that steel block to kind of like slow down the current if you need to do that. Um, so, but when I, ABI was selling these, kind of like the, the vacuum pump and the table and all of that, the wiring was really thin, like really thin. Um, and so much that you couldn't get enough current to the point to make a really strong weld. Um, so I found out I had to wire everything myself. Um, so this hand piece right here, there's two components to it. So there's this silver telescoping kind of tubing right here. And this is what's going to pick up the granule. And then this black line coming out of here, this is going to a pump. So this is the vacuum. And then this other line, this yellow one right here is going to the machine. Um, and then there's the part where you're picking up the components themselves. And this is kind of like breaking it down. I wonder if we can get to sure. in on this a little bit. So this is an old one. Like, so they've gotten a little tidier for sure. But the idea is that this is the line that's going to go to the machine. So the wiring is going into this kind of like bracket where it's soldered. And then this brass tubing right here, this is where the vacuum attaches to here. So I can suck the granules into this. Um, so you can notice that all of these materials are 
like super conductive. Like, so like copper is at the top of most conductivity charts and then silver or fine silver is another degree of conductive above that. So you want all these to be like very conductive because you want the current to flow to your joint. So if you have anything in here that would stop the current, that's where the, the weld would happen. That's where like resistance would build and it would short out. Um, and this kind of like mental game is that you need electricity to flow from the positive line all the way down to the end of the granule. And then where that sphere is on a flat surface, you want that exact spot to be where the weld happens. So these two are very similar and this is just a different setup, but brass tubing, and then there's a soldered component in the middle there, and then this telescoping silver tubing. And then the tubing is telescoping because for different size granules, I'll use a different kind of tip here. Um, and as things like short out, it does ruin the tip of these. So this is a consumable and I have to kind of like manufacture these to keep things going. Um, but look at the difference between these two lines. Um, this is maybe, what is this, 14 gauge, 12 gauge, but I've moved up to 10 gauge. And I really want that current to kind of like have this big like super highway to go down to the work itself. And then the wider the gauge of this electrical wire as well, the less energy I need to use on the welder. And the less energy I have on the welder, the less heat is um, created all the way down the line. And so I can get a stronger weld with less energy and it just makes things easier in general. All right, confusing, right? So this other component is, okay, uh, the little vacuum right here. Um, so I found, this is just a fish pump. But on the inside of this, when it's plugged in, there's a little magnet going back and forth. And as it, the magnet moves back and forth, that's creating the airflow. But there's also this diaphragm on the inside of it. And usually when you buy these for an aquarium, you want it to bubble and oxygenate the water. Um, but if you lift out that diaphragm and reverse it, then suddenly it becomes this little vacuum. So instead of buying a specialized like micro vacuum, you can get one for 10 bucks, which is kind of fun. And it's nice to like open up machines and like look at the, the guts, even though I don't know what almost all of it does, but it looks cool. All right, so with these two components, um, everything's lined up. So this welder's on. This one also has low energy and high energy. So low energy, like generally I'll use like low energy for low conductive materials, high energy for highly conductive um, materials. And then in terms of thinking about voltage, voltage is the, like how motivated the current is to get where it wants to go. So if it's on high energy, it's like really motivated, but generally it's too much for this whole process. So I almost always leave it just on low unless I'm fusing or welding like findings on the back of things like earring studs. Okay, so how does this all work? Oh, and I wonder if we can get like a super zoom in on this. Um, and we went over um, just the idea of like kissing numbers earlier, but this form right here, this is that three dimensional or one of the structures for three dimensional kissing numbers. So this is three sets of four spheres on the bottom in the middle and on the top. So, but on the top here, you can see that it forms that square, but then on the side here, it creates that triangle, one, two, three pieces. And those are the kind of like modular units for this whole thing. So, and then here's the kind of like triangulated base with three with one on top. And then here's the other base, just the square. And between those two scenarios, like all these patterns start to emerge. All right. I'm going to reset this a little bit. So you get the vacuum going, I'm simply going to plug it in. If anyone's like really curious about the fish pump, we can unscrew it and show you that whole thing. Okay, so at this point I have this line to the pump and it's pulling in the vacuum. And this allows me to pick up a granule. And I'm gonna make sure all these connections are set. 
And so the voltage, this one's a little bit above 20. So if the voltage is too high, it just will kind of like explode the joint, which is too much energy, too much heat. Um, so once all this is set up, I have a pedal on the floor over here that's hooked up to the back of the machine. Um, so after all of this setup, all the planning, this part is where I'm just gonna place it where I need it to go. And, and I don't know if you could hear that little sound, that little click. And now we have a welded granule on here. So if we look in at the side of it, perfect. Right, this is that little tiny connection point. So in traditional granulation, you would kind of have a little um, kind of like beveled foot and you can see it and you can make sure it's connected. But this one really has this minuscule contact point. So we're still at pretty low voltage here. So I might be able to pop this one off, but as you grow, like as you build patterns and you weld these to each other, the structure becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. So this one, that's pretty on there. So, but if there's ever a mistake made, let's say like on this big one right here, I have to go in with pliers, tweezers, and this is where I go through like quite a few pairs of flush cutters a month to try to like cut things out. So, but to pop it off, you have to use a tool generally. Um, okay, so if we turn this up, I'm just gonna turn it up to 40. And I think at this point, you'll be able to see the actual welding happening. Not that one, let's add another one. Line these up. So if we may be able to see kind of like the, the arc or the spark going between the two granules and down. Nope, not so much. And then this is where we can start to build up the form. Did you see that mm -hmm. arc? So this is kind of a uh, low hanging fruit, you could say. So like building the, like, this is the basic structure of like that cannonball stacking or oranges, stuff like that. Um, but what's really fun with this, and you can start to play with forms that um, defy gravity a little bit. So maybe, so we have another triangle on the side right here. So I can come in here and fix that. And you can start to build forms. Um, so one of the tricky parts with all of this is it can look kind of like bad pretty quickly. Just that if there's too much going on, the pattern is lost. So keeping track of where patterns start and stop um, closing loops, that kind of thing is a little bit of a trick sometimes. Okay. So, but here we have a base of three with three going around the outer part and then I could have three more. And then here's the different one where it has a structure of four. So in my kind of like mental memory bank of patterns, like looking at a, a basic shape, what can I do with that? So, and I understand that after all the setup, like this actual part of it probably feels a little anticlimactic in a lot of ways. There's no like flame, there's not a lot of heat. It's like a kind of a quiet, peaceful process. Um, but everything building up to that, the shaping, the stainless, all of that is kind of um, what defines what, like where the patterns are going to go. Um, so on a flat sheet, like as a sample, we can see what's going on. But then on something like this, so just like an earring right here, starting to mix a couple different sizes. So these are millimeter and a half granules right here going around the edge. And then all of those are kind of like stitched in on the side with these one millimeter granules. Um, and then, but kind of speaking about the alloys earlier, you can tell a difference. Like, so these granules on the outside, these are I think 316. And then these on the inside, these are 201 stainless. So there is this like subtle shift of grayscale. And I don't know how well you can see it on the camera right there. Um, but kind of like what we were talking about earlier about Sparkies or what this was really, um, what this machine is advertised to do quite often is to attach fusion findings here. So this is where I would like wire in some pliers into the welder hold this onto the surface and then I could weld a finding onto this. 
Um, so again, like the lower the conductivity of the materials you're working with in this process, the easier they are to weld. So something I'm looking forward to working with is really dialing in new parameters for working with conductive materials, namely gold, um, and blending that with stainless. And like early tests are really positive. So not gold to gold yet, but adding gold granules to stainless. Um, and I love that this merging the two worlds because that is, um, I have to make all the granules, organize them, sort them. So I like being in touch with that more kind of like traditional method of goldsmithing and granulating and then being able to blend it with these techniques. Um, so in a nutshell, this is how this works. I'm guessing some of you have some questions and I would love to clarify anything. Someone did want to see the inside of the fish pump. Okay. Dorothy, yes. you have that screwdriver? <laughs> Yes. Hold on one moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I can show that. Um, what else can I answer right now? Um, somebody asked, have you ever used a laser machine with granules? Uh, no. So I mean, I've played with some laser welders and I know it'll work with all the materials. Um, like what I kind of love about this process is that the vacuum gives me complete control and agility to put the granules where I want them. But if I'm working inside a laser welder, it could work, but that distance, because really a lot of the time I'm working like this close to the piece to see that the granule goes exactly where I want it to go. Uh, so yes, it works, but I haven't really played with it too much in this whole process. Okay, and then I have different size pumps also. So the larger the pump, the heavier the granule I can pick up. So as it moves up to like three, three and a half um, millimeter granules, then I use a different pump, but the setup is exactly the same. Could you talk on the dangers of shocking yourself? Uh, yeah, so imagine like nine volt battery, you're a kid, you wanna explore the world and you like put your tongue on a nine volt battery and you get that shock. So same shock, but it's 20 to 40 volts going through your heart. Um, so you make involuntary like sounds and you definitely like, you know, get a, a shock that stops you for a second. It doesn't feel good. It feels like you kind of like, you get burnt, but on kind of like the inside of your body. Yeah, it's really like a horrible feeling, so. Um, it hasn't happened for a while, but um, people who've like, watched me, especially when I was like, learning how to do all this, like, kind of like, about to see the after effects of that, and you can take a break for a few minutes. Okay. Um, and that happens when, I'm sorry, when the positive lead, if you're touching the negative and you're holding the positive, like this metal component, and if you hit the trigger, like if I hit it right now, that would happen. But I'm not going to demonstrate that, but... Um, so if everything's in contact, it's completely safe. And I hold on to all the metal components at once. So I can like, you know, cup it in my hand and have control. So it feels safe in that regard. Okay, we have the inside of a fish pump. So it plugs in, the magnet is activated once it's plugged in. Um, so I can actually plug it in. Okay, so we can see the magnet just going back and forth. And what this is doing is as this moves, it's shaking the, the diaphragm back and forth. And right now it's pulling in air. But if we turn this off and I'm gonna remove this rubber seal right here. And then this is the part, this white plastic component, this is the part you'll wanna flip over. So you kinda get a grip on the inside and you can pull this out and here it is. So with this on the kind of the way you're looking at it with this part on the right side, this is gonna be a vacuum. If I turn it 180 degrees, this is going to push air out. And it's kind of as simple as that. Now, how exactly this is working, I don't know. I just, you know, know this, like this fact that I can make this little vacuum on a need basis or like replace parts as I need to. Um, 
and I like that kind of like dipping into knowledge. You know, I'm kind of like a, a tourist in uh, pump engineering, but it's fun to open it up and like know that there's capabilities to do this. So you're going to push it back down and then you reseal around the edge right here and put it back together and kind of quick and easy like that. Awesome. Thank you for um, that demo within a demo <laughs> fish pump. I think it's really fascinating that that is part of your process. Just again, adapting materials. Um, I did want to touch on some other questions that had floated through the chat as you were demoing. Um, one person asked, um, as you're introducing new granules, does the voltage disturb any of the previously set granules in any way? No, they're all set. And then that current, like since you, since you are essentially breaking a circuit at that exact point of welding, there's no current to like dissipate into the, the piece. Um, so it is a very kind of like isolated incident for each granule that's attached. Yeah, so once everything's on there, unless it shorts out in a way that you don't want it to, so if it shorts out between the silver tip and the granule instead of the granule and the base, then that's problematic. Um, but if, if all is going well, everything is undisturbed outside of that, like, of the individual weld. And then um, someone else was interested, how much contact does the base plate need to have with the item being welded? So like thinking about the non-flat art items on a flat base. Oh, so that's a great question. So in terms of, let me plug this back in. I'm gonna answer this in a little bit of a roundabout way, but on the two, so if you imagine how the vacuum is pulling in the granule. So I have this like open circle of the tube. So if you think of the, the surface area of that contact, that surface area is greater here than the granule itself in contact with the sheet metal that you're working on. So you want the most minimal point of contact to be where you're welding it. So in terms of how much does this need to be in contact with the plate, you wouldn't want this like standing up on the tip like this. Like you can do some acrobatics and like put it on the side, all that. But you want that point, you don't want any point to be smaller than where a sphere meets a sphere or a sphere meets the plate that you're working on. Because otherwise it'll just short where you don't want it to go. So yeah, there's always this kind of like, you have tactics and you have to like strategize how you're going to weld pieces and the more complicated things become the more you have to really consider like how much one tool is in contact with another another tool etc so great question gotcha. um another question that was asked um has to do with some of like the sourcing of materials um do you did you say that you use tig welding for findings and other large parts uh, for the kind of infrastructure of all the jewelry is TIG welding. Yes. Gotcha. So, and the tungsten is a half millimeter. So it's these little tiny, like little tiny electrodes. Then um, someone asked, are you familiar with razor weld handheld fusion? Oh, is it the Razor weld? Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, same, same technology. I think you're just lacking some of the control, but essentially it's the same machine. So there's definitely those tools out there. So like the little Sparky, this machine, Razaweld, like they are, like they're all CD welders or capacitive discharge welders, or a synonym for that is resistance welding. Or if you're in industry, it would be stud welding, right? So all these are kind of describing a similar scenario. So the tools are like somewhat abundant. This is just a very kind of like novel way to use it. And um, another question that just came in, have you ever used a puck? Hopefully I'm saying that right, P-U-K. If so, how does it compare to this machine that you use? Um, so that's uh, an adaptation of TIG welding. So like micro welding, um, but yeah, so I use uh, an Orion. 
or just like a regular TIG machine. But yeah, so similar kind of technology. And have you ever tried 400 series stainless? And if so, why did you reject it for your artwork? Um, I don't know if I've tried it or not. I wouldn't be opposed to it. I think maybe it's just not a, an alloy that is available in the bearing ball universe. I'm sure it's out there because the lists go on and on. And, uh, you know, things like that can be manufactured out of any material. Um, I'd be curious as to like why it would be recommended, I suppose. But as far as like going back to the idea that it's more about the like conductivity of it, like being a stainless, the conductivity would be like super low. So it would work for this. Oh, someone, the same individual commented, no nickel in the alloy, so less expensive. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll, check it out. Yeah, I'll keep my ear to the ground. So, um, but buying these, uh, buying these is, is an interesting experience because I don't think ever again will I buy something like 40,000 units at a time and it comes in a package this big. Um, so that's always like a really like interesting package to get in the, get in the mail. Uh, whereas like materials for six months. Awesome. So I, um, I think that's all of the questions that have come in. Um, I'll use this as like a last call for anyone who had anything else they wanted to ask Ben. I guess in the meantime, I just really want to thank everyone for joining and like reiterating like my like, deep gratitude to the metal museum. This is, yeah. So this has been a blast. So thank you all. Thank well, you, ben. Up. Yeah. So, um, got a question. Um, you used to make objects, but now you seem to be concentrating on jewelry or body adornment and just asking for comments on that. Oh, um, yeah, I think that's like a really good observation. I think about that quite a bit. Uh, I mentioned before, like the kind of like relationship between like, uh, like how someone's personality, their body will like activate jewelry and how they wear the jewelry. Um, it's this like really wonderful symbiotic relationship and more and more I love that kind of like personal connection between this wearable object. Um, so, but I do like keep that like that history of sculptural objects like in mind quite a bit and when I'm making these pieces, I want them to be sculpturally compelling on their own. Because for the most part, they're not daily wearables, but I like the idea that it is considered in the round. You can look at it from every angle. Um, I think about them being blown up. So in a lot of ways, I'm somewhat limited by just the technology, the size of the granules. I do have this like dream of doing kind of like large installation where they're like, this welder is 10 times bigger. There's like a Ghostbusters pack and, you know, you can go around and like publicly grant it. Uh, so one day, maybe, uh, but I want to play with both of those worlds because if these objects get any bigger, it's going to start moving away from body adornment and more into like wall object or sculptural object. And I think that will come into play in the next years. So. Awesome. And we have uh, one more question slip in. Um, have you been able to do traditional granulation? Uh, yeah, so that Medusa piece in the show, yeah, so silver and gold granulation. Um, yeah, I can, I can do that. And it's not like my favorite studio process, um, but I love the look of it. So I, I get to kind of have both worlds in the sense. Uh, but using kind of like torch, gran doing tor torch granulation is, I felt as if I was gonna continue this type of work, um, I'd like learned it a long time ago and have practiced in recent years and I make pieces with it every once in a while. Um, but I feel that it's important for me to understand and be able to do traditional granulation if I'm gonna continue with this work. So I can like speak honestly to both sides. Awesome, I think that's it for questions from our participants. Thank you all for all of the great questions. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And, and thank you so much, Ben, for coming to the museum and, and demonstrating for us and, and talk about your work. We so appreciate it and, and are so happy to be able to share 
um, your show and your work with everyone in this um, virtual way. So yeah, uh, uh, adapting uh, all around. <laughs> I love that we can reach out to so many people. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This has been just a wonderful experience.